Hello everybody, great to be here. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm going to talk about collaboration, basically, and participation. So I know previous speakers have mentioned this, so I'm delighted to hear that coming up. All right, so um, in terms of the presentation, five parts of the presentation, so just going to touch on theory about what is collaboration, how do you do participation, um, barriers to participation, because we know that not everybody does participate. I'm going to talk a wee bit about social structures, because obviously it's easier to build on your existing structures rather than set up something new. And then look at a few case studies in terms of programs that we run in the Heritage Council. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. It's only a few examples for you today, OK? And then really to talk about opportunities. So that sort of feeds into the discussions we had already with the group work. OK, but just um, firstly, I just want to put up this theory here from John Friedman. So I came across this years ago, but I kind of I've used it a lot. So basically what Friedman is saying is that your environment, your life space must be in balance. Um, and what he's talking about here is the political community. So you've got your politicians, you've got your political parties. It all should be working in balance together. And then you've got your state, which is your courts, your legislation, whatever, in terms of running the country. Um, you've got your corporate economy, which are your banks and your financial institutions. OK, so remember that one. And then what he's saying is that civil society must be there to sort of balance everything, all right? So that's how we're, we're meant to sort of live with a, an active civil society. And then obviously, more importantly, we sort of live within a global economic space because decisions are made outside of Ireland that we have no influence over. All right, what is participation? So um, Etzioni, Amatai Etzioni, uh, 1968, very important year for the north of Ireland with the civil rights uh, marches and things. So basically what he was saying is you must have an active society that the corporate economy can run amok if it's not regulated properly, if you don't have a balance with your civil society, that that's what happens with the corporate economy, okay? It becomes feral. Um, also then Friedman again is saying that social learning is social empowerment. So again, a word that I use a lot is empowerment, community empowerment. What we try to do with our programs in the Heritage Council is very much empower communities. And then community spirit, okay, Etzioni again came back and said that we need to strengthen the community and the moral infrastructure. And also he was talking about the moral compass. So like where do we get our moral compass in Ireland at the minute? Um, I suppose during the recession I was kind of thinking about this a lot. I mean, I suppose previously we would have got, would have got it from the dominant church. Um, I think that, that has actually changed. Would people agree? You know, the moral compass has very much changed. So, where are we going to get our moral compass moving forward as a country? We're looking at Brexit, we're looking at Trump. I think it's something that, well, personally, I feel quite strongly about, you know, that we need to sort of think about what kind of society do we want to actually have and what kind of democracy do we want to have. And then David Wilcox, he's written a really good um, book in terms of participation, how do you actually do participation. So he's saying empowerment is participation. OK, so why do we want to participate? Why do we want people to participate with us and collaborate? So we're talking about working together. Um, this is all about synergies, you know, and we were talking earlier about communication. You know, if we don't have those communications, if we don't have that participation, we miss out on so much. It's about power to rather than power over. So it's about sharing power and it's about partnership because we don't know everything as practitioners. I mean, I, I do not use the word expert. I hate it because I'm always learning from communities and finding out what do they value? What do I value? How do we get a consensus if we can? How do we get agreement? Um, and really importantly for this is participation enhances democracy. So there's different types of democracy and what I'm going to focus on today is participative democracy as opposed to representative democracy, which is what we currently have in, in the Republic of Ireland, which is where you vote your TDs in and they go to Leinster House to the Dáil and we trust them. Okay, so partic participative democracy is more like a sort of Denmark, you know, Sweden, Norway. And then there's also direct democracy, which is where people have referendums or referenda, which would be Switzerland. So again, it's really to think about those sort of models about living in a balance and also what type of democracy do we have? Do we need a discussion in the country about the different types of democracy? Because I don't think that this is very much, you know, sort of, there's not very much awareness about the different types of democracy. And I think if you look at the parliamentary democracy in England at the minute, it's kind of quite scary um, in terms of what's going on in, you know, every day it's on the news. I don't know, I'm sick of Brexit now, but there you go. Um, concept of social capital. So again, it's about relationships having a value and networks actually having a value. OK, so we talk about GDP, we talk about GNP, but a lot of countries in Europe are now starting to say, maybe there's another way to measure this, right? 
And I do feel very strongly in Ireland that we have a lot of relationships, we have a lot of networks. So social capital is critical and we don't measure it. So for example, the GA would be a huge source of social capital. Our tidy towns would be a massive source of our social capital. But we don't measure it and we don't seem to value it. So um, again, this is the core of this presentation. And also we're talking about capacity building. And uh, fundamentally what we're striving for, I'm a planner over 20 years, uh, striving for a fair, open, collaborative systems. And we're talking about the common good which is enshrined in our constitution. All right, moving on, 10 key ideas. All right, so we're talking about different levels of participation. There isn't just one level of participation. Also, the participation doesn't just happen. Okay, so if you start a project or you want to talk to the community or whatever, you have to actually make that decision. I'm gonna go out and talk to somebody. I'm gonna actually go and meet with the community group or the civic leaders, you know, and, and for me, that's very, very exciting. Um, I really enjoy doing this work. Um, control, so who is actually controlling the project, who's controlling the budget, who's controlling the time scale and the scope. These all need to be sorted out at the very start. The more planning that goes into a project at the start, the more likely the project will be successful. All the project management studies have shown that. Okay, and then we're talking about control and purpose. So who has the information and who has the budget? Who has the money? You know, um, that word power, I think it is again very important in terms of what we're doing in the country at the minute. You know, who has the power, who won't give up the power, who is sharing the power, who's working in partnership with power. Um, if you do want to work in networks, you have to be able to loosen the reins. Um, the role of the practitioner, so that's really, you know, what's the background of the practitioner? Do they like working with, in collaboration with other agencies? Do they, do they like to collaborate with other people? Not everybody enjoys it, not everybody is up for it. So there's different animals and we have to obviously try and find out where are those people so we can try and change our systems a bit more. Then we're talking about stakeholders and community and what do we actually mean by community? Is it the person who shouts the loudest? How do we define our communities? You know, that all needs to be explored when we're setting up projects and programs. And then partnership, um, again, a word that I use a lot because basically with partnership, what you're doing is building trust. Um, and as we all know from our own sort of, you know, relationships, if you break trust with people, it's very, very hard to build it up again. It can take about two years to fix. You know, I've worked with some communities who have been, I suppose to use the word, damaged by their experience. Um, and then you have to come in and try and get them to trust you again. So that is actually extremely hard. Commitment versus apathy. So you've got people like, are they committed to the project? Are they committed to the vision that you're sort of trying to help them develop? Apathy, personally, I think that apathy is the worst thing that you can have in a society. I would rather see anger, because to me, anger is energy and energy that is negative can very easily turn into positive energy. So if somebody is apathetic, that doesn't sit well with me at all. I get very sort of upset, and very narked about it. So I'd rather see somebody marching in the streets because to me that is, that's, that's a, an energy that can be harnessed. Um, ownership of ideas. So I actually took this from a community group in County Meath. I remember here in the midnight when we were doing a workshop and they were like, we thought of that, we thought of that. So these are the kind of things that you know make my job easier in terms of getting out of bed. Um, because you're just so thrilled when you hear communities sort of feeling that they're being trusted and that they're being heard and that their voice is being heard. And then confidence and capacity again. Okay, so this is Sher Sherry Arnstein's ladder of participation. And I came upon this when I was doing my postgrad dissertation on community empowerment and urban regeneration. And it's been my guiding light um, throughout my work and life or whatever. So uh, just starting, it's quite an old model, but um, it's still one of the best, to be totally honest. Has everybody heard of this ladder? It's an American social, no? Social, right, great, now you have, fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, so at the very bottom we have manipulation and therapy. So those are basically where you get a PR consultant in to try and sort of put stories in the press. And I remember when I started out in Belfast, and we used to have a PR consultant, I was working for a, um, a development company. And we used to have a PR agent who came in every time for the meeting. And I remember thinking, goodness, would it not be better if they spoke to the community to find out what the community actually wanted? So. Yeah, therapy, I think, is a good way of putting it. You know, it's trying to sort of cure the community <laughs> of what their ills may be. Then informing, so you're moving up the ladder. We talked about different levels of participation. Informing is where you give out information, but you have absolutely no desire to get anything back from the community. Consultation is where, obviously, there might be a bit of sort of two-way street, but it's how you set up that consultation. And if, I, I mean, I'm sure lots of people in this room have done this, but so if you're having a workshop, there should be like a feedback report so that everybody, the community group that has attended your workshop can see that their ideas are down on paper and that it's a draft so that they can then have another opportunity to comment on what you feel they've said. Um, application is where you cherry pick a few sort of worthy people and you put them on your group. 
Partnership is where you actually share the power, back to this word again, power. Um, and with the projects that I run, the programs that I run, more than likely, um, the partnership, the group, will be chaired by the community. So I started that a few, quite a few years ago, and it was really interesting because they were saying, are you not going to chair it? And I was like, no, you are chairing this, and I'm here to facilitate what you want. So again, you're trying to trust people. Um, you want to make sure you have a good civic leader when you do that. <laughs> That's my lesson learned. And believe me, there's some fabulous ones out there. So um, delegated powers where there's more community people in the group. And then citizen control is like it's a complete community group. So um, I try to set up around sort of partnership. And um, I should say as well that with partnership, you do need a budget, you know, because as we all know, it's labor intensive. Everybody that I've spoken to today has sort of said, when you try to do this, it is intensive. OK, skills required from communities. So for participation, you know, a community can't just participate. It does need to have some kind of technical ability. It does need to be skilled up. And I think as well that we don't have the structures in place at the minute in this country to do technical aid. Other countries have planning aid. They have design aid. They have um, technical aid. So there's something that I would really like to see introduced in our country in a collaborative way, mixing the professions. So they need leadership. Um, they also need mediation skills. They need to be able to work in teams. Again, you're bringing in a community, maybe have got their own history and their own legacy with things that might have happened in their area or the, the, the locality of where they live. So, you know, you're talking about people that have maybe gone through things as well as a community. So you, you do have to sort of have understanding and try and help them with the technical stuff that they need. So again, the key word here is shared. So we're trying to find out, it's not just about a vision, it's trying to get a discussion, it's trying to get a consensus, an agreement on what they actually want. Right, so the core elements for participation, trust and understanding, access and information, voices and values, very, very important that the voices are heard and that the voices that are, that are heard are not the loudest ones or that are shouting or whatever. So you need to think about when you're doing your workshops and working with community groups that everybody can come out at a certain time. So usually that involves a lot of evening work. Um, negotiation and mediation and resources, which is usually time and technical ability. If you look at environmental impact assessment reports, you know, it's hard enough for a practitioner to sit and read an EIAR, it used to be called an EIS. I feel so sorry for community groups that have to wade through an EIS. I really do, because <laughs> I've read some of those in my time. Um, yeah, and the non-technical summary, I suppose you go to that first, but uh, yeah, it's difficult. So yeah, just for today's presentation, if you can remember three C's, which would be collaboration, cooperation, and coordination. So these are the three C's of community development. Um, some people would say that there's a fourth, which is competition, because we're all in competition for funds. Um, just moving on here, barriers to participation. So there are barriers, as we know. It could be lack of education, it could be lack of confidence, um, social segregation, lack of access to the web, actually. I mean, not everybody is connected to the web. Maybe not everybody has sort of, you know, high-speed broadband. So it's just to be aware of that. Then this map, um, if anybody has an up-to-date map, could you send it to me, because I need to update this, or update this, this map, it's too, it's too old. So it's from the census 2006, and it shows the level of volunteerism in Ireland. So you can see the travel to work area for Dublin. Um, obviously the green is sort of good. Um, Leitrim is flying. I don't know what happened with Donegal. Uh, <laughs> my family's from Donegal, so I'm not sure if they're all traveling to Derry on those very bad roads. Um, and yeah, you can definitely see patterns there emerging. So red is not good. Green is good. Right, social structures. So, yeah, we do have a lot of existing structures that we need to sort of, you know, champion, that we need to work on, we need to invest in. So we've got the local authorities, we've got the different skills. You know, how do we communicate with each other in those organisations? How do we work together? How do we, how do we network? Um, environmental awareness organisations, sports groups, youth groups. I've already mentioned the Tidy Towns. What a fabulous um, programme. I'm a little bit worried about the tidy towns in terms of the age cohort. Um, you know, has there been any assessment of our young people coming into this program? Is it sustainable? Do we need younger people coming through? You know, how do we target our young people to get them involved in civic activities? Civic trust, such an important thing. I mean, we're actually having our launch next week. We have two reports to be launched, so that'll be in Dublin Civic Trust. I mean, again, we should be investing in our civic trusts. And then we have um, Heritage and Schools, which is a wonderful program that Heritage Council runs. That also needs investment. Uh, and then we have the Institutes, the Professional Institutes. If I could just give you an example, the RAI and the IPI had a conference last autumn and it was on the same day. 
so nobody could go to you know, either conference. And that was the second year that that had actually happened. So I know somebody, one of our board members, actually wrote to the IPI to say, could we have these on different days so that at least we could potentially you know, work together or learn together? You know, there needs to be more collaboration at all levels. My goodness, huge amount of collaboration needs to start. Public participation networks, obviously they were set up recently um, due to the Aarhus Convention. You know, are these being monitored? Then we've got our cultural organisations. We need more planning and design courses in our schools. We did a review of the Village Design Statement Programme um, shortly after I joined the Heritage Council. I got it reviewed, evaluated. And one of the key findings was that we have a very poor level of understanding of good design in the country. So like, should we start in our schools? Should we sort of start to see, you know, this is what good design is? What are the principles of good design? What's the good principles of good urban design? All those things need to be looked at. And we need to start with the young kids, we really do. And then basically, as I said as well, about design aid and community-led toolkits. So this is a toolkit that I wrote in 2012. I'm not going to labour it, but it's there. It's on the web. So I'm going to talk about different scales. So this would be for sort of villages and also urban villages. And it's written just to make it really sort of participative. So it's very much colour-coded. Um, every section is in different colour. We did two pilots, one rural and one urban. Um, we got an award from the IPI, then we were nominated for an international award, so we went to China. Sounds very glamorous, it really wasn't. Spent nine hours trying to do a presentation, thought it was done. Yeah, anyway, so we got silver. Um, I think the fact we got anything was pretty, pretty good. Um, so yeah, IPI, National Plan Award, great. I love the IPI, I think that's coming across today. And then also just in terms of who are the users, so the Department of Housing has been a huge support. Um, and then Airgrid actually got wind of it, so they asked me to join their advisory group, so I was trying to help them with their communications to make it more participative, because they were obviously getting into trouble with communities. Um, and it really is about communication. It's funny how we talked about this in the workshop as well. So yeah, just to say thanks to the department for that. So yeah, as I said, it's very um, colour-led. Every bit is different. Then it has pull-out fact sheets at the back in terms of you know glossary um, of terms. That's another thing, right? So part of the Aarhus Convention is that you must have information on, um, on the environment, environmental information. So it's really to tell communities, like, what is an ACA? Because I find a lot of communities say to me, what is an architectural conservation area? I spend my whole time trying to explain that to people. So it's really trying to use the terms and let them know what are the terms that we all talk about as practitioners. And I think planners are really guilty of it, or I've been accused of it anyway. In the Heritage Council, that I talk in three-letter acronyms, SEA, LAP, you know, EIA. So it's really to enable and to allow those communities to work with us. And if they don't know the terms and they, they don't know the terminology, how are they meant to participate? So yeah, just to say the outcomes. So we evaluated the process that we changed. So it's a community-led, they chair, they're the partners. Uh, one of the things we introduced, cultural mapping. We also introduced agreed design principles. Again, very, very important to start to think about design because this really needs to start going into our LAPs, our development plans. I personally would love to see a huge growth in urban design in the country. Um, it fosters, as I said, participative democracy. Right, so this is, um, there's two visuals that I do with community groups if you're doing workshops, the two visuals that they get and love. The first one is the ladder, because you'll hear them saying, we want to get up the ladder. We need to get up that ladder, don't we? If you're walking around the groups. And the second um, visual that they get is this one, which is what is character. So myself and Colin Murray, the architect in our office, went to England and did a course and came back with this. So yeah, I mean, again, with communities, it's really important that you don't give them text. They do not have the time. They do not have the the will to live, to read text, they want visuals, right? So if you please use these diagrams to say the Heritage Council, we are there to facilitate groups. So it just shows you in terms of like what is character and explains it to them. You know, it could be about memories, it could be about the type of the building, the topology, it could be about the shape of the village, the town, the, the city. Um, all those things that people need to be sort of, you know, helped with and so that we can help them because we're the practitioners. Right, moving on now to the programme. So collaborative public realm plans. Okay, so basically if you're looking to regenerate your town, revitalise your town or a street, really what you should start with is where is your town or city now? Okay, so you need to do your take and stock, you need to look at your form, urban form, you need to do your surveys potentially do um, a collaborative town centre health check, which we started doing two years ago. It's really important that you get data. I think this came out as well in some of the previous speakers um, for the department. One of the key things was um, data sets. So then the next thing is, where do you want your town or your city to be? You know, what, what do you actually want to do with this place? Um, I find this so exciting because this is really where the community can go absolutely nuts and get the kids into the workshops as well. We did workshops in the schools. 
We did um, competitions with the kids, you know, to find out what's your favorite landmark building, what is of value to the young people, because obviously if they're going to stay in that area, they have to have an ownership in that area. So important, because we're losing so many of our young kids. Our towns are really, uh, I'll come on to it in a second, but our towns are really suffering. And how do we get there? So like, you know, you need a roadmap, you need a plan. It's very important for funders that you have a plan. You know, we all know that the risk goes down if you have a plan. So just a few things there. The Dairy Public Realm Plan, I worked on that before I joined the Heritage Council. I was in the private sector. I used to fly up to Dairy. Um, so yeah, I sent my family some Dairy Donegal. That plan is one of my favourite projects ever. So it's 75,000. One of the things we recommended was a footbridge across the foil, which became the Peace Bridge. So 40, uh, sorry, 75,000 for that study, and that plan brought in funding of 12 million. Then we have another one in Feathered, which uh, we funded that in 2007. That was 40,000, and we, um, we've um, estimated that that has brought in 6 million so far. So we've got the Thulsil, which had a feasibility study, and then Coolmore Stud came in with a million. Andrew Lloyd Webber was paying for the, the salary. Uh, then on to the Collaborative Town Centre Health Check training programme. So we started off in late 2016. We have a project charter. At the minute, we have 12 towns, and I'm basically sticking my finger in the dike because um, I, can't, I have no resources in terms of staffing or whatever. We have 60 plus partners. We have so many pillars in terms of people coming in. The EPA came in about two months ago, so we're now going to introduce vacancy into strategic environmental assessment. I'm trying not to use that three-letter acronym. Um, and then we do training workshops on a regular basis, so we're bringing people in and trying to train everybody together. That collaboration is there, so we have the private sector in, we have all the local authorities, we have the, the universities as well, and the um, third-level institutes. So I should say as well, then the European Commission got in contact in 2017 and they heard about this collaborative model. So they wanted all the programme documents. And then also I went over a few weeks ago and did a presentation on what we were doing in Ireland. So there's a 15 step methodology. Normally if I'm doing a presentation like this, I go through the 15 steps, but I don't think I have the time. So, but I would just say that all the information is on our website. One of the critical things is if you can't do the 15 steps, please, if you get a chance, do the land use survey because you need to work out your vacancy rates. Okay, again, the data sets are not there. So we're trying to create them. Um, and then it's also about supporting policies that are coming out of the departments. So it's the National Planning Framework, it's the National Development Plan, there's funding there. There is a new call that's going to come, I think, possibly in April, um, we're waiting to hear. I had a meeting with the department last week and they said there would be a focus on town centres. So, you know, it's really important that all the work that's been done is now given a chance to breathe and that the vision can actually happen and be uh, a reality. So there's two strands in the programme at the minute. Uh, the border towns, because I felt last year that the border towns were slightly neglected, uh, obviously with Brexit. So we're working with all the border towns. We have our workshop now on the 11th of April. Um, Department of Foreign Affairs are involved in that. The vacancy rates that we've found out are quite high. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, they're around 20% for retail, uh, even higher for residential. The upper floors are much higher. And then we have the Atlantic Economic Corridor Towns because we're trying to get ready for the Maritime Spatial Plan that is coming in 2021. So there's a lot of stuff coming from Europe that is going to obviously feed into what we're trying to do. We're trying to revitalize these towns in the west of Ireland. Um, I mean, it is a small part of the solution, I think, as well, that if we can get these towns with um, high-speed broadband, people would actually like to move to these towns from Dublin. We've done the surveys, the young people in particular, it's about quality of life. So opportunities for Cork, in terms of the MPF, you know, I was delighted, obviously there, there's a policy shift. Um, so we're talking about trying to contain sprawl and expansion because our town centres have very much suffered, you know, so I, I think rebuilding Ireland really needs to focus on the fifth pillar, which is reusing Ireland. Um, I personally would like to sort of see that rebuilding and reusing Ireland as a title, I kind of in my head call it that. So, and it's really just to think about the scale of the town and what is needed and to think about brownfield sites. I mean, there's a lot of structures that we need to set up in terms of you know, facilitating reuse and infill. Um, in terms of opportunities, yeah, please, you know, I would um, appeal to you today, you know, set up networks. We were talking about in our workshop, you know, networks for people who want to reuse buildings for these owners. We've got to help these people. Some of these properties have been sitting vacant for 10 years or more. I see recently in City Lab, if you have a chance to look at that website, that Barcelona has started fining people. Um, the vulture funds, if they have the properties vacant for two years or more. You know, we need to be innovative. We need to look at our partners in the EU and see what they're doing. So yeah, just to say, um, the OECD came out with a report in 2006 that said that Ireland is a relationship-based society, that we're not fantastic at systems, that we're very much relationship-based. And this fits in very much to the earlier theory that I was saying to you about the social capital, about the importance of relationships in our country. 
we've actually been seen to be, this is like our comparative advantage, and what the OECD said was one way to make this work, to make this really strong, is to set up networks. So we, I, I would love to see a minister for networks, but there you go. Um, that's one thing that I would definitely like to see coming. So yeah, it's just like, you know, create your projects, work with people. Um, myself, Liam Mannix, we're here today. You know, our door is always open, our phone is always on. If there's anything that you need, we work with local authorities every day. I would say get involved with town centres because, boy, do they need support. Support your national plans, your national strategies, the NDP funding call will come again um, in the next few months and create change in your lifetime. I think the only thing that we can do, all the studies that we're looking at, the research at other countries, it's all about collaboration. It is just there, all, every single program is involved in it. Okay, so just to summarize, we talked about participation, looking at Sherry Arnstein's ladder, and don't forget the character map as well. Um, trust and understanding and how to build trust and make sure that the trust is there. The barriers to participation, it isn't just going to happen, it has to be initiated, it has to be facilitated. Social structures, think about your GAA, think about your tidy towns, think about your way into your community, to that community, how can you help them, how are they helping themselves. Um, and then just look at toolkits, everything is there, we're trying to do documents and you know, guidance and toolkits for community groups. And then just look at new networks and really you know we need to say that investment is needed in setting up those kind of networks and getting that communication into a virtuous circle so that we start to really get modern in this country and try to regenerate our towns um the vacancy rate as i say is way higher than i ever expected so yeah just to finish off these are some of the lovely wonderful communities i've worked with over the last few years um yeah i just i love working with communities so if there's anything that you need please you know get in touch with myself all right, thank you.